Hello. Hello. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, on be Thank you. On behalf of Philosophy Club, I'd like to welcome you to this event. I'm really glad to see you all here. Um, my name is Alessandra Sanders. I'm the Philosophy Club president, and um, here's where I plug Philosophy Club. We meet Thursdays from 12 to 1 in Whitesides 118, and I'd love to see you all there. Whenever you've got the chance, we'd love to have you. On behalf of Philosophy Club, I'd like to say thank you to Dr. King for making time to join us this evening. I'd like to also thank the Philosophy Department for sponsoring this event and partnering to extend a public invitation to the members of our campus and beyond. Thank you to the Highsmith Student Union for accommodating us this evening in this space. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your, your evening with us. I'd like to now welcome our Chancellor Kimberly Van Nort to the stage for opening remarks. Thank you. get up there. Hello, everybody. Oh, my, that's a very bright light. That's a very bright light. I was not surprised to find these bookmarks on the seats today because the first time I met Professor Scott Williams was in his office over in Whitesides Hall, and he invited me to come over and talk about an idea that he had. And we talked about that idea for a while, and then he whipped this book out and said, I need to talk to you about this book. And I said, great, I don't know this book, I've not read it, but I'm happy to talk about it. And we spent a great hour-ish um, talking about what he had found so compelling about this work and how he was using it in his classes. And we had a wonderful discussion about pedagogy, about how philosophy lives in daily life, how we try to help students and each other um, be mindful and be thinking all the time. And what he told me is what I have hence discovered as I've explored the book and other ideas, um, is that it's a wonderful vehicle because it gives a roadmap and it gives some ways of thinking about thinking that are really innovative and they're really applicable to everything that we do every day. So an intellectual virtue is what we're here to develop. That's what we do at universities. We take these pillars as our guiding lights and then we test them and we help all of our students test them. And we go this way and we go that way and we help people understand how to develop their own ways of thinking so that they can come to those truths that they need in their lives. So I wasn't surprised to see these. In fact, I got a, I got a complete set. You all don't realize you know, I have the complete set now. Um, because it is truly something that you can carry with you um, as you move through life. And as we've discussed this book, we discussed it again last week in a wide-ranging conversation. We talked about a lot of things. Um, there is no more important time for us to be talking about this than today. There's a lot going on in our world, a lot going on. There are a lot of disagreements. There's a lot of civil unrest and, and uncivil discourse happening in our world today. It's an unsettling time, but it's an exciting time because we and you have the opportunity to begin to think of ways in which to unravel and to make it possible for us to have those civil conversations that we so desperately need to have. And many of the things, and I picked up the one first because I'm gonna keep this beside my uh, desk from now on out as I wrestle daily with all of these things, is the one that talks about open-mindedness, firmness, autonomy, and humility. For me, those four attributes, which happen to be, I took it as a sign, they're on the same bookmark. Um, they happen to be, for me, signposts in my own life. And I love this idea of learning by pushing and seeing where you are in excess or where you are in deficit in certain ways of thinking. So tonight is a very important evening. I wanna thank the Philosophy Club for bringing Dr. King here. I wanna thank the members of the Philosophy Department, the faculty who are all here. 
you students know, but you've got pretty incredible faculty members um, in your classrooms and as your mentors and as your advisors. And so we, we appreciate all that they do every single day for this university and also for the students who are here who are trailblazing, who are innovative. Um, we're working on a new kind of campaign to, to talk to prospective students about why they should come to UNC Asheville. And the tagline that we're gonna unveil in a couple weeks, I don't think anybody will get upset if I start here, but is it starts here. It starts here. Your journey starts here. And what better place to start than here at UNC Asheville, and what better way to make this a wonderful journey than by attending events like this. So thank you very much for inviting me. I am going to have to scoot out to yet another welcome tonight, but um, I'm going to turn things back over to Professor Williams to introduce our speaker tonight. All right. Thank you all for being here. It's a pleasure to see you all. Um, I'm really delighted to have uh, Nathan King here to give this presentation about intellectual virtues. Um, I met uh, Nathan King in graduate school. I happened to be at, visiting at his university for a few years as a visiting graduate student at the University of Notre Dame where he did his PhD. Um, so I met him there and sort of kept, kept in touch with him over the years and was really excited about the work in virtue epistemology and helping me to understand more about um, these topics and how to learn better and how to think about what's going on in education and learning. And so I wanted to just read very briefly some titles of things he's published in addition to this book that he's talking about tonight called The Excellent Mind. Um, so he's published things such as how intellectual virtues can help us build better discourse, conspiracy theories and intellectual character, intellectual perseverance, why, we can't, why can't we be friends? Reflections on empirical psychology and virtue epistemology, right? And on and on with other facets of intellectual virtues. Um, so I'm really pleased to have Professor King here tonight and to share with us what he's learned in his journey um, about these things. So just join me in welcoming Nathan King. Professor. Wow, thank you both for those kind introductions. I'm delighted to be with you tonight. This has uh, already been a great day in the UNCA community, and I look forward to good discussion and uh, our time together. So the main thesis of this talk is that intellectual virtues are an essential part of a complete education, a really excellent education. So that's kind of the thesis we're going to be setting out and then unpacking as we go. Before we do that, I thought just a warm-up activity might be useful. So what I'd like you to do is turn toward a neighbor and just discuss for a few moments what you might like written in your obituary. It's, it's just occurring to me now this might not be the best way to win over an audience, but let's just, <laughs> let's just, what would you like your friends and family to be able to say about you that's true uh, when you finally pass from the scene? Okay, so I suppose we'll come back together. There's no need to write the, the whole thing. But my guess is that for many of you, adjectives like these came up, right? Or they were kind or compassionate, courageous, loving, wise, right? Probably lots of things like these. I've done this exercise a few times, and these are the kinds of things that typically show up. Um, conspicuously, I haven't seen many terms like these. Uh, handsome, or beautiful, or well-dressed, or rich, or got good grades, or, you know, big on Instagram. 
those kinds of things don't usually come up. Those sort of uh, what you might think of as more superficial things that are nice to have in our lives, but not essential. But what this exercise, I think, suggests to us is that among the things that matter in the end is character, right? Character is one of the crucial things that needs to be embedded in a good life for a life to, to really be a full and good life. So we're gonna talk about that tonight, about character. When people talk about character kind of in the philosophical landscape, kind of two main kinds of character come up, intellectual character and moral character. Moral character, I'm sure, is familiar to all of you, right? So we've got these moral virtues, right, that concern moral ends like justice and kindness. You might even be familiar with the cardinal virtues, justice, courage, wisdom, and temperance. Those are a, a vital kind of virtue. In fact, the kinds of virtues that I'm gonna talk about tonight are modeled on moral virtues and sort of their structure, but they have a different aim than the moral virtues. The intellectual virtues that we'll discuss tonight concern what we might call intellectual or epistemic ends, right? So they're virtues that relate to our pursuit of things like truth and knowledge and understanding. So we'll, we'll unpack this as we go, but just to kind of locate the, the subject of our discussion, right, intellectual virtues will be the, the main thing we'll focus on. So what are intellectual virtues? Here's just sort of a, a first account that, that we'll then unpack as we go. So these are just the character traits of an excellent thinker, right? Intellectual virtues are the character traits of an excellent thinker. And as, as we spell this out, we'll spell out sort of what a character trait is and what kind of excellence we have in mind. But my guess is you already have a kind of an intuitive sense of what some of these virtues might be. So what I'd like you to do again for a moment is just to think of some traits, right? Maybe do this in, in small groups or with a partner. Think of some traits of an excellent thinker. Maybe you can list four or five of these. And we'll just see if these overlap with the intellectual virtues that philosophers have been talking about in the last, say, 20 or so years. My guess is there's going to be some overlap here. So why don't you turn toward a neighbor and see if you can list, you know, just very quickly, five traits of an excellent thinker, and then we'll come back together and sort of really get moving. Okay, so we'll come back together. If I had to guess, I would guess that at least some of the items on your list will overlap with some of the ones that are on this list that I'll, about, that I'll put up in just a moment. It's okay if there's not perfect overlap or anything like that. That's all fine. But these seem like some of the traits of excellent thinkers, right? When I think of an excellent thinker in my own mind, I think, well, that person's curious, right? They care about knowledge and they seek knowledge. They ask good questions or they're careful. That's the kind of intellectual virtue that we need to avoid falsehood, especially when falsehood is salient, right? In areas where we make mistakes in reasoning, maybe easily. Intellectual autonomy, right? We think of good thinkers as people who think for themselves, maybe not by themselves, but for themselves. They take responsibility for their own learning. Intellectual humility, a kind of willingness to recognize and then do something about our intellectual limitations and even our weaknesses. Intellectual honesty, right, it all sort of starts there. A reluctance to distort the facts or the truth, right, to, to respect the truth is central to intellectual honesty. Have you ever met a great thinker who wasn't intellectually honest, right? That, that's, those those two, two things kind of uh, would jar together in my mind, right? Great thinker, dishonest, those don't seem to fit together so well. Intellectual perseverance, the kind of virtue we need to keep pursuing truth or keep distributing truth in the face of obstacles. Intellectual courage, the virtue that we need to continue in the face of obstacles that are maybe uh, scary, right? And that could be as simple as raising our hand in class and asking a question, we're a little bit nervous about that, or it could be you know, as grand as defending the cause of social justice in the face of dissent. 
Open-mindedness, the trait we need to consider carefully the merits of views that differ from our own, whether they're just new views or views that actually oppose what we think. Intellectual firmness. So if open-mindedness is the virtue we need to expand our perspective, right? Firmness is the virtue we need to maintain that perspective in the face of dissent, right? Especially dissent that, that doesn't stem from good reasons. Fair-mindedness, a kind of willingness to uh, have a level playing field between our views and those of others, or our arguments and those of others, right? Having the same intellectual standards for ourselves that we hold others to. And then intellectual charity, a trait that goes beyond fair-mindedness. So you might think of fair-mindedness as kind of not doing to others what you wouldn't want done to you in intellectual circles. Charity goes beyond that, right, to actually doing unto others what you would want done to you in intellectual circles and activities. Okay, so those are some intellectual virtues. I should add, there's no official list here, right, so if there's one that you've been thinking of that's not on the list, th this certainly isn't an official list. My sense is there are gonna be as many intellectual virtues as there are areas of activity in which we need excellence for proper functioning. Okay, so the first kind of inroad into intellectual virtues was this basic account of intellectual virtues as the traits of a good thinker. And then a second inroad was this list. I think a third road into intellectual virtues and my favorite road is to just give some narratives of what intellectuals, intellectual virtues look like in action. So some of you know about Helen Tausig. If not, I'd like to introduce you to her. So she was the founder of pediatric cardiology. She did all kinds of things in this field. She helped invent a surgery called the Blaylock Tausig surgery, which saved the lives of countless blue babies. Some of you maybe have heard of blue babies. These um, infants have a, a, blue confection, uh, a blue complexion due to a heart defect, and she found a way to uh, develop a surgery that saved many of their lives. She laid bare the dangers of this drug called thalidomide. This was a prenatal sedative that resulted in very problematic um, birth defects. This was discovered in Germany, and she helped prevent it getting released in the United States. She went on to win the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest honor a civilian American can get. She helped found a pediatric cardiology program at Johns Hopkins University and was the first woman to be president of the American Heart Association, right? So I think we can all agree, very impressive, you know, resume, right? But if you had known Helen as a child, you would not have expected grand outcomes like these. So as an infant, she contracted tuberculosis, as a result of which, for several years of her young life, she was able to attend school only half time, right? So she's sort of set back in that way. She also struggled with number recognition and letter recognition. This was later um, diagnosed as dyslexia, right? So she had some trouble getting going with the learning process, even over and above this, um, this early childhood trauma with tuberculosis. When she was 11, her mother died. So lots of trauma early in her life. But she kept going despite this with, with the help of a supportive father. By the time she was ready to graduate from high school, she was college ready. So she went to Radcliffe College and then on to UC Berkeley and succeeded there, though by her own estimation, she had to work harder than many other students did. As she graduated from UC Berkeley, she decided she wanted to go to medical school. Now, the problem at the time was that most medical schools would not admit women. And so she applied to several medical schools in, in the hope of gaining admission, only to be turned away time after time because she was a woman. She found a workaround. She eventually entered a program at Johns Hopkins where she decided she wanted to study pediatric cardiology, to which many of her advisors replied, that's a dead end field, where there's nothing worth studying there. Right? She, she kept going. She, she, as she puts it, she galloped into this new field to find when she got there that there was not much data to work with, not much data that she could use to conduct her research. So she generates the data herself by making her own observations, gets the field lifted off the ground, and then in her early 30s begins to lose her hearing. Now think about that. If you're a heart doctor, what's your most important instrument, right? It's your stethoscope, right? So she begins to lose her hearing. She finds a workaround. She puts a little amplifier on her stethoscope until she 
almost completely loses her hearing, at which time she finds another way to keep track of what's going on in the heart, right? So she's one of the people who invents palpation as a way to see what's going on the heart. Uh, with the heart. She relies on other instruments and just keeps going into this field. That, I think, is about as moving an exemplar of intellectual perseverance as I can think of. When we think of all that she had to endure to gain an education, to gain the knowledge that she sought, and to do the kind of good in the world that she wanted to do, uh, this required tremendous perseverance. Okay, so sometimes we need perseverance to gain an education or to gain new knowledge. Other times, we need perseverance of an intellectual sort to keep knowledge or to share it. So some of you uh, probably have read this novel by Ray Bradbury, Fahrenheit 451. So uh, it's in a, a recent film, uh, Michael B. Jordan, kind of the key star. And the, the plot of the book, I'm not gonna spoil it for you, but the basic plot is the main character, Guy Montag, played by Michael B. Jordan, is a fireman. This is in a sort of dystopian future world and the, the key feature of firemen or the key job of firemen in this world is that their job is to burn things, right? Rather than put out fires, they burn things, especially books and the people who own them. So this is a, not only a, a dystopian world in general, but it's an intellectual dystopia because it's illegal to own books. Well, Montag one day discovers in a home he's getting ready to burn uh, a book, and he gets curious. And so he brings it home with him, and right, he gets curious about the book, he starts to love the book, and then trouble ensues. Eventually, he finds himself on the run. And there's this point at which he's on the run and encounters a group of kind of intellectual nomads. And what these people do is they gather books as they're able, and then they memorize them. Each person memorizes a book. And then each person burns the book in order to destroy evidence of their crime. So as Montag is talking to one of these nomads, he describes to Montag the goal that these people have. And it just turns out that it has to do with keeping knowledge and passing it down. So here's what Montag uh, and his friends say, or here's what Montag's friend says. All we want to do is keep the knowledge we think we will need intact and safe. We'll pass on the books to our children by word of mouth and let our children wait in turn on the other people. And when the war's over, someday, some year, the books can be written again. The people will all be called in one by one to recite what they know and we'll set it all up in type until another dark age. We might have to do the whole damn thing again. But that's the wonderful thing about humans. They never get so discouraged or disgusted that they give up doing it all over again because they know very well how important it is and how worth doing, right? Those are people right, who memorize whole books in order to pass on the knowledge that they've gained, right? So one of the things I've loved about studying intellectual virtues is finding these narratives. And once you have the category in mind, you can sort of spot them everywhere, in fiction, in the news, in uh, the lives of people around you, um, right? So, so these narratives are a helpful way into a discussion of intellectual virtues. What I'd like to do next is unpack the account that we started with, right? So we started with this notion that intellectual virtues are the character traits of an excellent thinker, right? So let's unpack what this means. What does it mean to talk about a character trait of an excellent thinker? So there's a, a more detailed account on your handout and we're just kind of work through the key terms in that uh, account, right? So intellectual virtues, right? They're excellent character traits. They're not averages. They're not traits that everybody has. They're, they're truly excellent traits that make people stand out. As character traits, intellectual virtues are more than just behaviors. Right? They involve our behavior, but they involve more than that. They involve our internal dispositions, right? So they involve our actions, how we behave in relation to truth and knowledge and things like that. But they also involve our thoughts, and our motivations. So you might think about a person who is curious, right? That person will believe that knowledge is valuable. Or you might think about a person who is intellectually humble. That person will believe that it's good to know what their limitations are, right? So there are thoughts that go along with these virtues or that help constitute them. And then there are also motivations, 
right? An intellectually virtuous person will desire knowledge and will be averse to falsehood, right? And that kind of person will be motivated to seek knowledge, to seek reasonable belief, and to avoid the opposites of those things, right? Um, To avoid falsehood and ignorance and sloppy thinking. That person will will be deeply um, motivated. They will desire to seek the intellectual goods and to avoid the intellectual evils. Okay, so this helps set up right, the object of intellectual virtues, right? They're oriented toward truth and knowledge and understanding. This is what makes them differ from moral virtues. So moral virtues concern our relation to moral goods, right? Justice, kindness, and so on. Intellectual virtues concern our relation to things like truth and knowledge and understanding. Many of these intellectual virtues can be found in means between extremes. And so if you've ever read Aristotle on moral virtues, this will be familiar language to you, right? Means between extremes of excess and deficiency, right? So here's uh, a little chart of intellectual virtues. And so you notice that the virtue, right, in this case of open-mindedness, stands between two vices, right, a vice of deficiency, right, closed-mindedness, and then a vice of indiscriminateness, right, where you just sort of listen to everything. Uh, Not every trait that goes by the name open-mindedness is the genuine kind of open-mindedness. So I found this Onion article a while back, open-minded man grimly realizes how much of his life he's wasted listening to, and then I'll, I'll let you read the, you know, read the rest of the the headline. Okay, that, and the, the article, it, it's funny, it goes on to talk about how much time this man, Blake Rickman, has wasted, you know, listening to people talk about the merits and demerits of certain pens, or he's listened to, you know, people trying to sell him things he knows he's not going to buy for countless hours. And the thought is he's just sort of taking things all in with no ability to discriminate between what's worth taking in and what's not. Okay, that's not open-mindedness, whatever we might call it. That's the, the vice of indiscriminateness. Okay, but do you see how this works? So each virtue involves an area of activity, right? So for curiosity, I think of that as kind of managing our intellectual appetite. For um, autonomy, the, the relevant sphere of activity is independent thinking and so on. And the thought is you might be either deficient or excessive in in any of those areas, the virtue is found somewhere between those vices of excess and deficiency. Okay, and then the last bit, these intellectual virtues are to some extent person sensitive, right? To some extent person sensitive. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that, uh, you know, we're embracing some kind of uh, relativism about intellectual virtue or anything like that. It just simply means that intellectual virtue, right, what counts as excellent, what counts as an excellent effort, might vary from person to person because it's going to depend on things like that person's background and their training and what's difficult for them and what comes naturally to them. And the thought is different people, you know, with different abilities and training and background might display these virtues differently. So, I mean, you might think of a simple example so imagine writing a paper for a class. It's a, maybe it's a two-page paper on a topic that's new. This might seem sort of daunting to a student, but might not be daunting to Dr. Williams here, right? Uh, there are some, uh, some areas of training right, that, that he's enjoyed that you haven't yet enjoyed that make this an easy task for him and a difficult task for you. Well, it might take genuine perseverance or genuine courage uh, for someone who's new, who's new to an area to write a paper like that in a way that those virtues aren't required for Dr. Williams. Maybe what's required for him is you know, submitting a paper to a new conference or to a new journal or something like this. Maybe that's when he needs to call up those virtues like perseverance and, and courage. But the thought is there's, there's room for differences in intellectual virtue all of which still display genuine excellence. So I I like that, I think that's a helpful feature because it suggests to us that an intellectually excellent person can differ from yet another intellectually uh, excellent person. It's not like intellectually excellent people all have to look the same, some cookie cookie cutter uh, approach. Okay, so when we talk about this doctrine of the mean and intellectual virtue, one time uh, someone asked me, 
well, wait a minute, the middle, right, the mean, isn't, doesn't that sound mediocre, right? Isn't it, right, sometimes we don't wanna be in the middle place, right? The middle place isn't usually the best place or the good place. Sometimes to be in the middle is mediocre. So why is it excellent to find the mean? I think a helpful way to articulate this is to borrow something else from Aristotle. So he has this image of an archer and a target. So just as a good archer needs to avoid missing high and low and short and long and left and right, so a virtuous person needs, Aristotle says, to do the right thing at the right time in the right way and for the right reason. Right. Now, Aristotle is giving that as part of an account of moral virtue, but I think we can borrow this image of the target as we discuss intellectual virtues. So, to commit an intellectually virtuous act, that act needs to take the right object, right? If we take the wrong object, if we're thinking about the wrong things, we'll miss the mark. That act has to be undertaken on the right occasion, right, or else we'll miss the mark, through the right means, or else we'll miss the mark, and with the right motive, or else, again, we'll miss the mark, right? So you might think of curiosity, right? What does that look like? Well, that will take as its object, right, a, a sort of quest for knowledge about something that's valuable, right? So maybe knowledge about something in your major, right, in physics or psychology or something like that, but maybe not knowledge about celebrity gossip. To commit an intellectually virtuous act, we also need to do it on the right occasion, right? So if we're asking questions about physics in the middle of a poetry lecture, right? Probably not the right occasion for that. We've gotta be sensitive to whether our action is occurring at the right time, in the right, in the right setting. Um, if, we, if we commit our act using the wrong means, we'll miss the mark, right? So if, if we've got a question about high-level physics and we ask a high school student, or a, a peer we know is untrained. We'll be seeking knowledge, right? We'll be curious, but we'll be seeking it through unreliable means. Or if we seek knowledge through the wrong motive, right? We'll miss the mark, right? And we all know people like this who seek a lot of knowledge, but they do it maybe to just display their own intelligence or cleverness. We call these people know-it-alls, right? And this isn't a compliment, right? So they're seeking knowledge, but they're seeking it sort of with the wrong motive. Okay, so, so here's where we are. We've talked about why character matters. We've talked about what intellectual virtues are. We've spelled out this doctrine of the mean. And now the question is, why should we educate for these virtues, right? Why might that be a good thing? So let's just sort of build a case here. And we can, I think, assimilate this to the question, why go to college, right? We're talking about education in a college setting. Now, I think there are some answers to this question that are perfectly good that don't mention intellectual virtue, right? So going to college to meet friends, right, and find community. I think that's a good answer to the question. Going to college to prepare for a job, I think is also a good answer to a question, right? Intellectuals shouldn't denigrate people who just wanna find a way to make a living. This is a really important part of life. Uh, but I suspect these aren't the only good answers to the question. I mean, after all, we can meet friends in other ways. And the jobs for which we prepare in college are, are not often the jobs that we'll stick to for a whole career. So hopefully there's more to, uh, the, the, more to an answer to the question than, than just these items. I suspect that in many of our minds, uh, part of the answer is something like this. Well, I wanna go to college because I wanna become educated. And college is a place where people can go to get educated. Okay, that's, I think that's helpful, but it just raises another question, right? What we wanna know is, well then, what is it to be educated? What is it to be educated? Well, let's, let's start on that, right? So one answer is, to be educated is to know a lot, right? Knowledge is an important goal here, right? Knowledge rhymes with college, right? Maybe we're really onto something. And that's right, but have you ever met anyone who didn't put their knowledge to good ends? Or have you ever forgotten some of the knowledge you gained on, you know, as you studied for a test? I, certainly I have. The process of moving away from a test is the process by which I slowly forget all the stuff I learned, you know, when I was studying for it. 
right? So, so knowledge, you know, it can become obsolete in certain fields, we can forget it, and we might not put it to good use, right? So that suggests, right, maybe there's more here. Uh, one central problem can be if we've just got kind of isolated bits of knowledge, we might not be able to connect those bits to each other. So you might just think, well, something else we need are skills. Maybe transferable skills. After all, those could help us move across jobs. Skills in logical reasoning, critical thinking, that help us to connect some bits of knowledge to others, that help keep us uh, away from falsehood, right? That, that keep us from fallacious reasoning, right? Those seem central. But I would suggest knowledge and skills aren't enough even taken together. And that's because you could have knowledge and skills, but not wield those well or wisely. So I'm reminded by, of these lines from, uh, from George Orwell. This is from Politics in the English Language. He's talking about political discourse in his day. So he says, in our time, political speech and writing are largely the defense of the indefensible. Indefensible acts can indeed be defended, but only by arguments which are too brutal for most people to face, and which do not square with the professed aims of political parties. Thus, political language has to consist largely of euphemism, question begging, and sheer cloudy vagueness. Political language, and with variations this is true of all political parties, is designed to make lies sound truthful and murder respectable, and to give an appearance of solidity to the pure wind. Right, so what's he saying there? You can find people who know a lot and who are intellectually skilled. In fact, they're so skilled and they employ their knowledge in such a way that they can manipulate people, right? You really can know a lot and have good skills and not wield those to good ends, right? Not, not wield those to truthful ends. So what else is needed? I suspect that at least part of the answer to that question lies in the intellectual virtues. Right, these virtues of intellectual character, which we hope in a complete education will be added on to knowledge and skills. Uh, there's this book that came out, I don't know, about 10 years ago now by Andrew Del Banco, in which he makes a kind of case for intellectual virtues in education. He doesn't call them intellectual virtues, but in thinking about what he hoped for his students, he entered into these conversations with colleagues, right, talked all around campus, and he came across this colleague, colleague Judith Shapiro, who, in answer to this question, you know, what, what are we doing here in college? What should we hope for our students? She says, well, you know, you want the inside of your head to be an interesting place to live the rest of your life, right? I love that. You want the inside of your head to be an interesting place to live the rest of your life. And so, in this book, one of the things that Del Banco does is unpacks what kind of features a mind would need to have in order to be an interesting place to live the rest of one's life. So here's, here are some of the traits that he highlights, right? A skeptical discontent with the present informed by a sense of the past. That sounds a lot like intellectual carefulness and humility. The ability to make connections among seemingly disparate phenomena, that sounds a lot like attentiveness, right? This kind of creativity begins with noticing things. Third, application, or excuse me, appreciation of the natural world enhanced by knowledge of science and the arts. That sounds a lot like curiosity. And then fourth, he says, a willingness to imagine experience from perspectives other than one's own. That sounds, at least to me, like open-mindedness. So one way we could put this, and, and this is sort of triangulating between Del Banco and recent work on intellectual virtues, is that intellectual virtues help us make the inside of our heads interesting places to live the rest of our lives. Notice also, if you were to start to list the traits of a lifelong learner, I bet you would list a lot of these traits. And that's, I mean, that's another way of putting what we desire for students, right? We hope that they'll become lifelong learners. Okay, so if we've made the case for why we should educate for intellectual virtues, or for, or for the students here, you know, why we might think of our education as a place where we can grow in intellectual virtue, the next question becomes how to do it. On this point, I've gotta say, I, I really recommend to you this book by Jason Baer, it's called Deep in Thought, A Practical Guide to Teaching for Intellectual Virtues. This will be especially helpful, I think, 
for the, the faculty who are here tonight. So uh, much of what I say will, will at least dovetail with, if not just borrow from, what Bear says about this. So, so here are a few thoughts, and, and maybe during kind of our discussion time, we can brainstorm about this a little bit together. So first, we might start by talking the talk, right? If, if we speak in terms of intellectual virtues in our classrooms, in our one-on-one -on -one meetings with students during advising or in the campus coffee shop, right? Then we, we make the edu educational setting a place where we recognize that we might be seeking these virtues. Another good place to do this is in syllabus language, right? We might write meaningful growth in intellectual virtue into learning outcomes and course objectives and things like those. Another thing can be linking assignments to specific intellectual virtues. So there, I mean, here you can, you can just be creative. So here are just a few thoughts. So when we assign difficult readings to students in our classes or when students find themselves reading something that is difficult, those are occasions on which we might practice intellectual perseverance and carefulness, right? Even, this is a, even though this is a difficult text for me, I'm gonna push through and try to learn what I can. That's seeking knowledge in the face of an obstacle. That's intellectual perseverance. Or carefulness, right? I'm gonna mark up this text in such a way that I can really track the argument and analyze it, right? That's just an everyday assignment, right? We, we do difficult readings in our classes all the time, but that's an opportunity for growth in intellectual virtue. So the, one of the key points here is that it, teaching for intellectual virtue or learning for intellectual virtue isn't so much about changing around the content of the course, right? Changing our, our whole syllabus so that everything in it is just centered on intellectual virtues. We don't have time for that. But it's really about the way we approach the assignments that we already have on our syllabi, whether we're faculty or students. If we can approach them under this, this framework of intellectual virtue, then every assignment not only has a, a specific discipline, a disciplinary objective, but an, an objective in terms of intellectual character. So when we assign or write term papers, those are opportunities to encourage students to think for themselves or for students to think for themselves and make an original contribution. But who doesn't find term papers daunting, right? A little bit scary. Well, so then this is an opportunity to develop courage. Or sometimes we assign students, you know, to, to group up in partners and give each other feedback on their papers. This is an important occasion on which to develop honesty, right? It's, it's, I, at least I find with, with my students, it's difficult to get them to criticize their peers. They don't wanna hurt people's feelings. So this is a chance gently, you know, to practice honesty. Well, I wasn't sure that this argument quite worked or, you know, this sentence could use some work or something like that. Right? This is a, an occasion on which to practice intellectual honesty, right? And then courage. It's scary to critique a peer, right? How are they going to react, right? This is the kind of situation in which courage becomes salient. Or what about talking the talk in terms of the feedback we provide, whether we're students providing feedback to a peer or faculty providing feedback to students, right? So Bear distinguishes between kind of thin feedback, oh, good job, right, outstanding work, right, that kind of feedback as contrasting with this kind of feedback, right? You, oh, you showed courage in defending this controversial view, or you showed open-mindedness in trying to learn from this author's argument, right? I know you said in class you disagreed with this author. You did a really good job of taking the merits of their view seriously. Right, or you know, what you say is, is good as far as it goes, but why don't you dig a little deeper here, right? This, this is an opportunity to practice intellectual thoroughness. So, so part of talking the talk, I think, can be getting these virtue terms into the evaluation of, of student writing. And, and for those of us who have to write, whether students or faculty, to think in these terms as we develop our own work. So there's talking the talk and then there's walking the walk. And for, the, for the faculty here, I suggest kind of showing rather than telling, right? So ra rather than say, well, okay, I'm gonna show you what intellectual virtue looks like and then you know, make myself the, the hero of my own story. That's probably not the way to do it. But we can display these virtues in various ways, whether through our own activity or through exhibiting uh, or, you know, the activity or another. Right? But we might just simply say sometimes, I don't know. I can remember 
having professors who would sometimes say that in response to questions that were asked in my classes. This had a big impact on me. First of all, it made me realize, oh, even the professor has limitations. And second of all, it helped me realize, oh, maybe that's okay. Maybe it's okay not to know it all. And if I recognize that I don't know it all, then I'm invited into all these opportunities for learning that I wouldn't otherwise have, right? That I wouldn't have, if I, no, I do have to know it all. I can't, I can't admit my ignorance or my weakness, right? Uh, for curiosity and inquisitiveness, I think as, as faculty ask lots of questions in class, and not just rhetorical questions or questions of the sort where, you know, so if you're faculty, you know this, like, you've got an answer in mind, right? And the game is to have the students guess what you're thinking. I don't so much mean questions like those as new questions that arise in the course of the discussion, right? Something occurs to you in the midst of the discussion. You're not sure where this is gonna go. Maybe it's okay to ask that question in the middle of class and just see where the discussion goes from there. Carefulness, right? We can slow down and dissect an argument, right? We don't need to uh, go through the argument quickly. In fact, it's much better often to write it in step-by-step -step form and go through it in a detailed way than it would be to, to just get through it because, well, something else is coming up on the syllabus, right? So slowing down, being careful. Displaying open-mindedness, right? Oh, here's something I learned from this person, right, that we're reading, right? In fact, I disagree with this author, but here's something valuable, right? And you can probably imagine how this might go in your own class, um, in your own mind, right? Or sharing about our projects, right? So what about faculty members who, who share how difficult it is to write this paper for a journal, right? Or how a conference presentation maybe didn't go as well as I had hoped it would go, right? These kinds of things invite students into the, into the process of seeing that intellectual growth is a process and that, we, that we're not all fully formed, not even professors. Another thing we can do is tell stories, right? I, I tried to do a little bit of this at the outset. This is the most inspiring part of it for me because you really see what these intellectual virtues look like in action. So just one more story from me. This is about Gottlob Frege. Some of you might know Frege as one of the founders of modern logic. Uh, so Frege had written this book on the basic laws of arithmetic and it had been well received. He was just about to publish the second volume of the text and he gets this letter from a young philosopher called Bertrand Russell. And Russell had recognized that within Frege's system was a fatal flaw, right? Some of his assumptions entailed a contradiction, right? So he's got a big mistake right in the middle of his project. And Frege, because he was well established, could have just brushed this off or scolded Russell for being, you know, a, a petulant young scholar. But instead, what Frege does is publish Russell's objection as an appendix to his second volume. So here's a, a letter that's often quoted from, from Russell in which he just marvels at the kind of honesty that Frege displays. So he says, as I think of, about acts of integrity and grace, I realize that there's nothing in my knowledge to compare with Frege's dedication to the truth. His entire life's work was on the verge of completion. Much of his work had been ignored to the benefit of men in, infinitely less capable than he. His second volume was about to be published, and upon finding his fundamental assumption was in error, he responded with intellectual pleasure, clearly submerging any feelings of personal disappointment. It was almost superhuman and a telling indication of that which humans are capable if their dedication is to creative work and knowledge instead of cruder efforts to dominate and be known, right? That's just, I mean, can you imagine your whole life's work right, going up in flames and publishing the objection of the person who showed the fatal flaw, right? This is remarkable. Lots of other places we might go for stories. Some of my favorite uh, books along these lines, they're just chock full of stories. This book by Rachel Swaby, 52 Women Who Changed Science in the World. This book by John Gribben, The Scientist. It's about the scientists of the scientific revolution. And then, of course, uh, recent hit, uh, Margaret Lee Shetterly's Hidden Figures. But, you know, as we look for stories, that's when we really see what the intellectual virtues look like in action. Those are some places to look. Uh, last thing we can do is hold 
practice, right? Our friend Ted Lasso, right? He's always talking about practice, right? So uh, what he says dovetails what, with what our friend Aristotle says, right? Aristotle says, things we have to learn before we can do them, we learn by doing them, right? So if we're not a careful thinker yet, well, we, we learn that by trying to think a little more carefully than we did yesterday. Now, there's this wonderful thinking routine by Ron Richart. He's an educational theorist at Harvard School of Education. And he's got this routine called claim support question, right? So this is, I, I hope everyone will, will take, you know, three logic classes during college. But if you can't fit that in, maybe you buy a logic book later, but start here, right? So claim support question. The way this works is when we're, we're discussing a controversial topic, we first find the claim at issue, that's the C. Then we identify the support for the claim, that's the S, and then we begin to ask questions, right? So, for example, right, something that might come up in a moral philosophy class, right? An argument for, uh, say, relativism about morality, right? So the claim is uh, there's no objective truth in morality or, you know, right and wrong are just matters of opinion, or, right? Or something like that. Maybe that's the claim. And then often the support will be something like, well, different cultures have different moral codes, right? We've identified the claim, identified the support, and then we might begin to ask questions, right? Well, does this, how well does this premise, if it's true, how well does it support the conclusion? Is the premise true? Um, it looks like in this case it is. Uh, what other conclusions are compatible with the same premise? Questions like those can help our logical reasoning, you know, even before we've had a chance to, uh, to take a logic class. Uh, other things we might do, uh, argue the opposite, right? Argue the other side. I'm sure some of you have done this or had to do this in class where you're tasked with arguing for the position you don't in fact hold. That can help us become more open-minded and empathetic and often we just end up convinced of the view that we thought was false at first. Uh, or what about revising and resubmitting our work? Academics have to do this all the time for journals, but maybe this should be something we do with our term papers for classes, right? Assign students a paper, provide a lot of feedback, and then they get a chance to resubmit. But there's really no end to the kinds of things that we might do to foster intellectual virtue in the classroom or to seek intellectual virtue in the classroom. So th th my last word would be that we can just be creative about this. A way to do this might be to, you know, take a, take your, you know, your, whatever your favorite best teaching book is, your best learning book is, and just list the practices that are involved, right? So in this case, you know, maybe multiple draft papers, right? Ken Bain suggests this. Or having students build part of the syllabus, right? Just make a list, and then we can start to draw lines between the practices on that list and various virtues that might be fostered by those activities. Uh, as, and as, as we get into this, you know, what we might find is there's just an endless supply of exercises by means of which we might pursue these virtues together. Uh, the goal, I think Jason Bear is really helpful in this point, the goal probably shouldn't be that we all arrive at perfect virtue. That might get discouraging. But what about this? What if we just sought meaningful growth in intellectual virtue, right? What if we sought to be better today than we were yesterday and better in four years than we were when we came into college, right? Those would be, those would be worthy goals. And if we accomplished them, I think we would find that, that our education had been you know, worthy of the name. Okay, I think I'm gonna stop there. And I think we've, do we still have some time for questions? This is the microphone where you ask your question. So if you have a question for Dr. King, please come up here and ask him the biting, crucial, crucial question, the fatal flaw That's right. <laughs> in his presentation. Yeah, you don't have to be shy or nice. Philosophers are used to, when the Q&A starts, the, the contest is to make the speaker look foolish, so go crazy. Hello. Goodness. Uh, so when considering intellectual virtues in the academic sense, um, how do we know when, when an instructor is being virtuous, when we're being vicious or deficient? What are, what are, how do you know? Yeah, good, good. So I guess there, there are some different ways you might 
try to do this. One would be to just ask basic questions like, do I, does it seem like my, my behavior is deficient in one way or excessive in another way? But I think the, the nicest shortcut that I, that I could come up with would be to imagine someone who has the virtue that you're seeking and then compare what you're doing to what you think they would do in like circumstances, right? So am I, am I being fair here? Well, I have a colleague in my department who's eminently fair. And I think to myself, you know, what, what would my colleague do in this situation, right? What would they be thinking? What questions would they ask? How would they behave? And then I can kind of gauge <laughs> what I'm doing or what I'm tempted to do by what that person has done. Or you might imagine, you know, say you're thinking about you know, whether you should quit on a project. You might try to imagine what, what Helen Tausig would do if she were in your shoes. I think, to me, that's the kind of, that's the more helpful kind of thing to do than to come up with a criterion. In my view, or the criteria that we develop should always be sensitive to our judgments about the cases in the first place. So then, that just leads me to think the cases are a good place to start. Um, we can ask other questions, like, well, am I doing this is, is the knowledge I'm seeking valuable, right? Is this the right object? Is this the right occasion on which to seek this knowledge? Am I seeking it in good ways? You know, uh, am I using good means, right? Those are, those are other questions we might ask. But I think even before that, you know, looking, at, looking at the kinds of people whose minds we would like ours to resemble and asking what they might do in, in like situations, maybe a good start. Hi. Um, my question is, um, how do you view the relationship between intellectual virtue and moral virtue? Um, and should the institutions that are teaching intellectual virtue maybe also teach uh, moral virtue? Yeah, good. This is a great question. I've had lots of conversation with Dr. Williams about this over the last day. So the, the basic answer is, first, this is, this is quite complicated. There's a lot of controversy even in, in the literature about what to say here. So what I'm gonna say is just kind of a, maybe a start. So uh, what I suspect is that in a fully formed life, a fully virtuous life, the intellectual virtues and the moral virtues are gonna regulate each other. So I mean, let me give an example of that. So uh, being loving, that's an important trait for a person to have. And we, we consider that you know, a moral trait. Am I loving toward my family members? But I've noticed that there's this intellectual virtue of attentiveness that's going to be really important if I'm going to be able to love them well. If I'm inattentive to their needs or concerns, that's an intellectual flaw, but it has a, a bad impact on my moral ability to love them well. So I think that these virtues are going to have to be mutually reinforcing to some extent. Now, what I, what I don't know is whether to think of intellectual virtues as a subset of moral virtues or as wholly distinct. I think they do aim at least, you know, in the first instance at different goods. Intellectual virtues aim at truth and knowledge and the like of that. Moral virtues aim at things like justice and kindness. But it, it's hard to see how I'm gonna be a fully morally virtuous person without some of these intellectual virtues. Uh, there's this author, Philip Dow, he has this nice line. He says, try loving your neighbor while practicing intellectual hastiness. He says it can't, it can't be done. So I suspect, you know, strong ties between these, even if they're, they end up being a wholly distinct set of virtues. Yeah. Is it possible to be intellectually virtuous in a way that is still in bad faith? I guess it's kind of similar to the previous question about moral virtues versus intellectual virtues. Yeah, in bad faith. So hold on just one sec, because I've got to follow up. And could you say a little bit more about what you mean by bad faith? Um, I mean, no big deal if not. No, I'll leave that open to interpretation. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, so as, as I think of bad faith, I think, so what is it? Uh, at a minimum, it seems like it's a kind of intellectual dishonesty. And so if that's right, then I guess the, the answer is, well, no. You, I mean, you might, you might exhibit some intellectual virtues while still exhibiting bad faith if you know, you've got two totally separate inquiries or something like that. But I wouldn't think that you could, at the same time, 
exercise intellectual virtue in an area where you also are exercising bad faith. It, it seems like that, because it seems like bad faith, whatever else it is, is, is not intellectually honest. So, I don't know, maybe that's a start. Yeah, that's right. First, uh, I appreciated what you said about saying, I don't know. I think that's like a very powerful tool, especially when you hear it from someone you respect for them to say, I don't know. But um, I want to ask you a question about how do you go about steel manning an argument with that you don't necessarily agree with? And over the course of your career, have you developed methods that have helped you take the position of the other side? and? Yeah. emphasize with them and come to conclusions that help you uh, see their point of view while yeah. necessarily not agreeing with it. Yeah, no, great. Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. So about steel manning the other side. So, so steel manning, uh, if you're not familiar with this, it's the opposite of what we call straw manning, right? So a straw man argument is an argument that casts someone else's view in an unfavorable light, right, by making it look less plausible than it really is. Steel manning would be making the person's argument look as strong as you, as you know how to make it, right? Maybe even if that makes it better than the actual argument that they gave. And this is, uh, this is a, a practice that um, a lot of people think, and I think there's a lot to this, is an important practice and an intellectually virtuous one, right? So the question is, <laughs> how do we make ourselves do that when the view on the other side is something we disagree with vehemently, right? Is that, that's, the, that's what we're getting at. So I, I, I wish I had a, a magic pill I could swallow that would make this you know, easy. But I suspect that simple things like putting ourselves in the other person's shoes and imagining how much we would appreciate it if they steel manned our argument. Uh, or maybe reminding ourselves that if we don't steel man their argument, then, then whatever intellectual accomplishment comes with the criticisms that, that we're about to give, uh, will come to naught because they'll they'll attack a version of the view that's not as strong as it could be. So, I mean, we've got to be careful that we don't end up badly motivated here, but I, I do take it that we want to make intellectual contributions, and certainly if we're straw manning, but probably also if we're not steel manning others' arguments, uh, our contributions just won't be as lasting or as valuable. So, so maybe maybe a kind of combination of the the personal right. What would I like this person to do for me, and this more abstract? Well, hey, this isn't going to be a lasting contribution if it doesn't cast my friend's view in the in the best light it it can. At least the most rational. It's got to be at least the most rational version of the the other person's view. Yeah. I should say it should also probably be recognizable as their view. So there, there could be a kind of patronizing sort of steel manning where the, what, you, what you construct as a steel man version of their view is so far from what they said that it's almost like you're patting them on the head. So this is a tough needle to thread, but I guess those are a few, a few thoughts. Yeah. Do you feel as though uh, practicing a religion or a tradition of sorts would uh, help you build sort of these intellectual virtues? And then on the flip side, do you think there are instances where practicing a religion would sort of diminish your intellectual virtue? <laughs> yeah, I think probably yes to both, right? So it, it probably is going to depend in large part on the religious community in which you're embedded. I mean, there are some religious communities that are intellectually vital and that are not insular and that do a really good job of being fair and charitable to those on the outside. And then, of course, we all know about religious groups and non-religious groups that are insular and that, you know, demonize or other people on the outside. So, I, I mean, I think this is an area where we need to, to choose our friends and probably our parents carefully. Thank you. Uh, so the question that I have, maybe more I want to think with you, or so you are acknowledging a number of virtues, right? So of course, as a philosopher, I'm like, is he going to um, 
prioritize them, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I want to do like a can't move on you, right. right? I want to say, is there one that is primary, right? I would say maybe open-mindedness is primary. Yeah. So that's one question. And the other question, uh, related question that I have, which I think is more pressing for me, is that you, this is very interesting, but you seem to be, um, at least from the presentation, you seem to be reflecting that we can, it's up to us. We can just, the world is perfect, day is beautiful, everybody is well, <laughs> good willing, let's practice intellectual virtue. Good. Yeah, good. World is not that, right? Yeah. Especially for certain kinds of demographies. Right. So for those demographies, and I know, and I appreciated your saying that virtue would look differently for different people, but I think that actually doesn't do the job because for um, some demography of people, curiosity is not a virtue. Uh, sorry, um, humility would not be a virtue because the standard view has expected that. So I would, I'm sure you have much bigger story. So how would you account for those kinds okay. of Great. nuances? Great, yeah. Thank you. So I'll start with the, the question about priority. And there, I mean, I think I've got a, a few thoughts, but what I find is that when I, when I try to prioritize one virtue, its friends kind of come along. <laughs> and so I end up thinking, well, maybe, maybe there are more that, that we have, that have to take priority. So I suspect, I mean, one way to think of this might be in terms of, okay, there are some virtues that we need just to get inquiry going. So probably curiosities like that. Probably autonomy is like that. And probably humility, right? So we've, we have to be curious, right? We have to care about the, the truth and care about knowledge. Um, we have to take responsibility for our own learning, right? So autonomy. And then we have to recognize at the start of the process that there are lots of things we don't know. So maybe those virtues are, are helpful at the start of inquiry. And then there are, there are other virtues that might come alongside that, that might, and, and here again, I'm borrowing from, uh, from Jason Baer, keep inquiry moving in a good direction. So there you might think open-mindedness is especially helpful, right? Considering the merits of others' views. Or you might think that perseverance is really important because after all, inquiry gets really hard. And so we're gonna need to find ways to keep going. So yeah, I don't have a, a taxonomy or a kind of order of priorities that's gonna to apply to all situations, but those would be some that I would suggest kind of for starting inquiry and then getting it going. Um, I appreciate the, the question about how these virtues look for different demographies. And so I'd, I'd love to maybe chat more with you about this afterwards. But one thought I've had is that, okay, if, if we're talking about a person from a historically marginalized group who is standing up for their rights, that's, that's not gonna be an occasion, usually, on which humility is the primary virtue they should have in mind. I might think on that kind of an occasion, a virtue like intellectual courage or a virtue like firmness, right? No, you're not gonna talk me out of my rights. That might be more appropriate. So I, I don't pretend that we're gonna be exercising all of these virtues all the time. Um, rather the thing to do is to exercise these virtues as the occasion demands. And, and my thinking is, you know, for, for someone in a, in a marginalized group, the occasion for humility, especially, right, rec recognizing limitations about their own experience, like that just doesn't seem to fit as well as something like, you know, firmness, right? Defending their own perspective or courage, standing up for their rights in the face of dissent. So it, I think, you know, once we recognize that which virtue is appropriate to exercise depends on the occasion and the relevant factors. Uh, I hope we can at least assuage the worry that this, this framework is going to be a, be a problem for marginalized groups. Um, on the, the, so toward the end, you suggested this kind of concern about, um, uh, is this, I mean, I'll, I'll put it in my own words, is it too glib to just be like, oh, let's grow in these intellectual virtues? And so I, I think you're right to, to have some concerns here. One thing that I think is, important is getting a realistic estimate of where we stand with respect to these virtues 
And it might be for, for many of us, uh, the answer is we don't have them yet. And it's gonna take a long road for us to, to get them. I suspect that, that most of us are neither you know, fully intellectually vicious nor fully virtuous. We're somewhere in between virtue and vice. Um, and so that's why I wanted to put the, the language of pursuing these virtues in terms of meaningful growth, right? For, for some of us, it might just be a small step forward that, that leads us just a little bit out of vice. And what is, I think, is it Horace? He says, the, you know, the first step in virtue is to flee vice. Like, for some of us, that might be the important first step. One thing that I'll, that I'll add is that you know, I wrote this book on intellectual virtues and nothing has made me, you know, more aware of my intellectual flaws than writing about the virtues. Um, I, I've certainly got a, a long way to go. And, and I suspect a lot of us uh, have a long road ahead, but I suspect that sometimes even small steps along that road can make big differences for us. So at least I hope so. Thank you so much for an interesting, interesting talk. I learned a lot. Um, I have two questions, and I imagine that your answer t to the second one will depend on what you say about the first one. Um, what is the distinction in your work between epistemic virtue, straight up, and intellectual virtue? And that's what I keep tripping over that. And yeah. um, my second question is to put forth if you'll permit, just an example. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I, I regard this as a potential, I was thinking about maybe a counterexample, a conflict between the moral and intellectual virtues. So suppose someone has a, a terminal diagnosis and they you know, make a decision to, in belief formation, they decide that they can defy the, you know, contrary to evidence, they right. can defy the statistics and survive it. Right. Um, that might be believing unreasonably, yeah. yet nonetheless justified. Um, the other, if, if I may, the other thorny example would be, suppose you learned some a terrible piece of information about someone you loved, say that they had committed an atrocious crime, and you sort of per per persist in refusing to believe that they did it, motivated by love for the person. And that, that would seem to be a kind of intellectual vice, but perhaps a moral virtue. Yeah. So, yeah, those are great cases. Okay, so the, the first one, the difference between epistemic virtues and intellectual virtues, for better or worse, I, I would use those terms synonymously. Um, Intellectual maybe is a little, maybe that's a little more in our vernacular uh, than, than epistemic, so that's why I haven't gone with epistemic. Um, I like these cases. I mean, the first thing I'll say is I'm not quite sure what to say about them. So, I mean, maybe there are genuine cases in which you get conflict between moral and intellectual virtues, and then we've got to ask, you know, what gives? Okay, so the first case is the case of the, the terminally ill patient who gets themselves to believe that they're going to survive because this, this raises their odds of survival. Yeah, yeah. That strikes me as a case in which either the um, moral goods override intellectual goods, uh, or maybe it's a case in which this person is, uh, at least to some extent virtuously, using the knowledge that if they can get themselves to believe uh, that they'll survive, that this raises their odds. So that, I mean, that is something that they know, right? So that there is this, this exercise of knowledge in there, and that uh, maybe to some extent you could say is intellectually virtuous, but you do, you do worry about self-deception there, um, which is a thorny issue in its own, its own right. Uh, let's see, the, the second case was uh, covering up a loved one's crimes. Was that the... Of refusing to believe, yeah, refusing to believe, yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah, so I wonder in that case, I wonder in that case if, if you know, it's, it's morally good and loving to require a high threshold of evidence before you'll believe that that person is guilty. 
um, do you think you reach a point where it's just like, um, no, it's not only intellectually bad, but now it's just also morally dishonest. But, but yeah, I, I, I can imagine, I mean, and you can imagine good epistemic reasons for, for having a high bar. It's not just because this is, you know, my dad, it's because I know him really well, and I have this background evidence that suggests he would never do such a thing, right? Um, so, you know, maybe this is an issue where we've got to fill out the details of the case. So, yeah, maybe there are cases in which the two can really conflict. What I'm always going to be looking for in those cases, you know, in a case where, say, the, the moral looks like it would outweigh, is, well, is there, is there more going on to the story intellectually that will make it the case that the intellectual virtue is actually assisting the moral one? I mean, I, I hope we live in a world like that, but we might just live in a world, right? We live in a world where many of us think there are moral dilemmas. Maybe there can be moral slash epistemic dilemmas too. Um, so I guess that was a long way of saying, I don't know. Is there intellectual virtue in not learning things for the sake of leaving knowledge unlearned? Like we talk, like as you mentioned that case where if you have a, like a disease that will kill you, just like I'm not, I am going to not at all exhibit curiosity <sighs> about this. Or like how we we have this belief that all people are created equal, which is like if you think about it too hard, kind of breaks down. So just don't think about it too hard because it's useful to believe. <sighs> Is there intellectual virtue in just yeah, letting sleeping see. dogs lie? Let's see. Okay, well, so I think the, the general answer is, yeah, there are going to be lots of cases in, in which we just shouldn't exercise our curiosity. <sighs> which cases those will be, probably a longer conversation. But, yeah, I think, I mean, short answer, yeah, there are lots of cases in which the knowledge to be sought is either... Um, not worth having in any case. Maybe it's just trivial, or maybe it's um, maybe it's knowledge that's none of our business, right? That would be another kind of case. So it, it's it's definitely not like exercising curiosity, you know, in in the vernacular, not virtuous curiosity, but curiosity in the normal sense, like seeking knowledge. There'll be lots of cases in which that's not an apt thing to do. Um, I think of those cases as like intellectual gluttony. In, in action, yeah. But are, maybe those are different from the cases you have in mind. We can we can chat more about that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Let's thank our speaker. <laughs>